for having me. Um, I'm Gabrielle Vaughn, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit more about these Tocladia species that we found in the Yucatan Peninsula, where I'm going to be studying their population genetics and their distribution. So a little bit of background information about the Yucatan Peninsula is that they actually have no major lakes or rivers. Their only source of fresh water is found through these underground flooding cave systems, locally known as cenotes, but they are essentially water samples. And the Yucatan is considered one of the world's most understudied ecological groundwater systems and is home to an extensive karst aquifer ecosystem containing various connections to inland and coastal sites. Coastal caves, I'm sorry. Um, it is actually home to more than 70 stegobiont species, or cave-adapted species, and 70% of which make up crustaceans. And um, this research includes, uh, will now include regions of Belize, but um, the Yucatan Peninsula includes this region, and um, yeah. So, um, background information of, of Tofladia is that they belong to the Atiyadei um, family that is predominantly freshwater and non-cave um, adapted. And it's comprised of about 200 uh, shrimp species representatives, and it's actually an NKA um, cave genus. They're relatively pretty small, um, about less than 10 millimeters big, um, and they're found throughout the freshwater caves as well as NKA um, cave systems um, of these aquifers. And at least 17 species have been described worldwide. Um, here in this map right here, um, we have um, the little uh, red dots is pretty much um, highlighting any kind of ink killing um, cave sites, and the yellow um, circles enclosing those are where we find Atiyadei and Ankyolene species. That includes our one right here in the Yucatan, which we're really focusing on. Then right here we have a, a phylogeny of the Atiyadei family. It seems a little kind of hard to interpret now that I'm looking at. But if anything, um, anything that is gray are pretty much cave adapted like um, clays. But right here we have this one right here, this little denotation right here, but this is mainly a clay right here that um, includes Artifadia species that is um, um, sorry, that is um, solely um, NKA like um, um, cave species. So a little bit about their phylogeny here is, um, as you uh, see right here in this top part right here, um, we have, um, this is based off of uh, mitochondrial genes, uh, 16S, CO1, Site B, and nuclear genes, 18S, 28S, and H3. And this is pretty much a, um, what um, current data shows that um, there are five species, and that includes Tophadia pierci, Mitchelli, Zillimensis, as well as these two that I'm very briefly just gonna mention, uh, species A and species B, there is relatively little data, but um, they're, um, these are the, this is the known phylogeny, uh, current phylogeny, um, that is. And here's just a map showing their distribution. So the colors you have here, yellow, red, purple, correspond to this map here and showing their distribution. And again, I do just want to highlight that our Zillimensis is a coastal, coastally restricted urethalian species. And then this is just um, showing here their uh, solidity preferences here, where you have these little white little water droplets indicating fresh water, where they were found in fresh water locations. And that's pretty much um, all species except for Tufadia zillimensis, where you see a range where you find them in both fresh and um, mix of kind of like um, mid to high salinity levels. So Yucatan Tufadia. So these species are endemic to the Yucatan. Um, previously, there were four documented species that included Pierci, zillimensis, Michelite, and Campeche. Pierci and Michelite, which are considered vulnerable, and Campeche, which was considered threatened, or is considered threatened. And um, as of um, currently, um, molecular analysis shows that there are actually five genetic lineages that includes um, those two new species, species A and species B. They're still um, undescribed or quite uh, rarely found, um, which kind of leads to the question of once this analysis was done, uh, was done and they were pretty much indistinguishable to probably from your side, which leads to the question whether they are still relatively threatened or whether they're being considered vulnerable like to probably appear size species. And what we know about these species is that they express evidence of syntopy, and for example, um, by syntopy I mean where they're found in the same um, habitats or cave systems. And this is pretty much representative here where you have uh, like a species A, um, I think species A or B um, mixed with uh, Zillimensis, um, yeah, species A and B mixed with Zillimensis. And then um, as well as over here we have Pierci and Mitchell kind of lingering around. And then um, this is just kind of also highlighting that you can find these Zillimensis um, species in fresh and um, more saline, um, saline waters. And these two new species of Tufadia that are undescribed, which are pretty much rarely ever found, um, they are um, species A is currently being described in the Bodeo lab, and Tufadia species B unfortunately needs more samples for a little bit more kind of um, refinement. 
And the research questions that my um, experiment aims to um, answer is, what is the distribution of the five species from Tufaria within the Yucatan Peninsula? And can the distribution and population genetics of these species provide insights into the historical connectivity between and among cave systems within the peninsula? So my research design consists of five major parts, um, consisting of sampling, genomic DNA extraction, gene amplification and sequencing, analysis of population genetic diversity, and species delimitation. So a little bit about sampling is that um, the samples were collected from about 30 inland and coastal cave sites throughout the Yucatan, um, as well as marine caves in Belize. And these samples were collected, frozen, and processed for their molecular data, and uh, any additional um, environmental data, if it were available at the time, that was collected includes locality, salinity, depth, pH, and oxygen. And then it's just a little, this little photo just kind of shows me what the tiny these little guys are. And then um, moving on for the genomic DNA extraction and application and sequencing steps, um, we extracted um, the DNA to isolate mitochondrial DNA as well as nuclear DNA from these samples, where we um, ran them through PCR and purification steps, um, and they were confirmed through geoelectrophoresis methods to show that bands of the fragment size of DNA were there. Um, as well as once that was confirmed, we went ahead and uh, sent this off for sequencing, and um, just a little, um, just information as far as the DNA fragments that we amplified from the following genes included mitochondrial genes of 16S rRNA, CO1, and site B. And for the nuclear genes, we included 28S rRNA, where um, only select representatives are going to be analyzed for um, that gene, and ITS. And I do want to highlight that ITS is going to be newly added. Um, it's, there hasn't really been much information as far as kind of any ITS gene data, from nuclear gene data, and hopefully, or the inclusion of this, um, anticip we anticipate on it building a newly available genetic data, um, data and providing resolution among the populations of these species. And uh, as far as any um, analysis of population genetic diversity, we are going to be doing this by haplotype network reconstruction uh, that will pretty much allow us to understand species distribution and connectivity throughout these cave systems. We are using the computer software Genius Prime to edit, assemble, and align sequence molecular data and to allow for any visual visualization and analysis of phylogeographic relationships and population structure among these species. We did haplotype network reconstruction and computation of genetic diversity values using the HAP, um, HAPnet complexity Pegasus package in our studio. Um, and then lastly, we also um, use the GPS visualizer software um, along with coordinate files to generate a map um, to, that delineates the distribution of species representatives. And then, um, uh, one of the last uh, main parts of the experimentation is um, involves um, species delimitation methods, and I just kind of want to briefly just kind of mention that, that we want to use these methods to separate individuals from a species and a population of a species. It allows us to quantify the number of genetic lineages, and um, essentially this consists of about five different um, species delimitation methods, but essentially each method has their own um, kind of purpose where we are either producing barcode index numbers or um, generating a species hypothesis um, or um, generating accurate species estimates as well as delimiting species from single locus genes and or clusters. And then lastly, to explore any haplotype relationships. So preliminary results we, that um, I currently do have um, on haplotype network re reconstruction and diversity values is solely based, um, at the moment, based off 16S rRNA gene data. And just a little bit of um, what these values mean, um, these, um, the values I'm gonna kind of, like, um, kind of dive into, um, we have a haplotype network branch diversity denoted as HBD, and that pretty much provides probabilistic values that two random individuals from a population have distinct haplotypes with differing number of branches. Haplotype diversity denoted as HD um, provides genetic diversity, and branch diversity denoted as BD provides evolutionary interrelationships between haplotypes and a population. And again, um, we are doing this um, in our studio using the HapNet complexity, um, uh, yeah, using HapNet uh, complexity with a Pegasus package. And then um, I will, um, this is just a little overview real quick. Um, here on the top, um, A through C are our haplotype networks, and then D through E is pretty much showing um, where they're kind of distributed. Um, A and D right here are similar to value of here side. B and C, I'm sorry, B and E is for Tufadia vitulli, and C and F are for Tufadia zilinensis. 
So looking closer into Tefadio Pierside, um, doing the um, haplotype network um, reconstruction and diversity value analysis. This was done on about 313 base pair fragments. Our sample size for this was about 10 uh, representatives, and it showed that we have two haplotypes. So haplotypes are denoted as individual circles, so this is just showing that we have two. The bigger the circle, the more abundance of um, individuals that are in that um, haplotype. And what this showed is that, that we had six variable sites among seven populations, or seven um, locations where they were um, collected. And this is across about a 200 kilometer um, region. And we did have a haplotype diversity of value or genetic diversity of a 0.2 with no branch diversity or haplotype branch diversity values. And some things to note here is that these are um, correspond, the colors on here correspond to the map. So I do want to um, highlight here is that we did find, this is something to look further into, but we did find that we have this um, representative here found along the coast, but it is separated from the rest of the other samples collected. The other samples were all clustered into one haplotype versus this one um, uh, separate one. And I do find it interesting because um, we do have two along the coast, but only one of them was separated into its own haplotype. Okay, so the haplotype, I'm sorry, yeah, the haplotype network reconstruction for Tufadium Mitchelli was based off about a 480 base pair fragment size, and uh, this was about 31 um, samples, and it generated about 12 haplotypes, where it identified 16 variable sites among 13 populations or collection sites, and again, this was across a 200 kilometer um, um, distance. And here we do have a better um, genetic diversity value of 0.83. And um, some things to kind of um, to, um, highlight from this haplotype is that um, these um, this cluster right here um, is found right here with these inland um, these two these purple and blue um, samples. So that kind of clustered into its own um, haplotype. But then these guys right here, we have we got orange and blue over here where they're found along the coast, and then we got purple as well as like these other greens that are found inland. So I do find it interesting that we have these kind of separating, we have inland and coastal um, samples of these species clustering into their own um, haplotype. And then the same thing for these other guys, we have a couple of purple and pink, a lot um, with these like red, um, yeah, red, red and yellow. Um, again, coastal and inland um, samples found um, together in their own haplotype. And then for Tepadian um again, highlighting that these were, these were all collected throughout the coast, um, just further proving that they're only really found off the coast. Um, we had about 64 representatives, and it um, gave us about nine haplotypes. And it had seven variable sites among 15 population or collection sites. And this spanned about 700 kilometers, so this was much wider. And um, our haplotype diversity, or genetic diversity, was about 0.72, which is surprising because um, in t our Tepadia Mitchelli, we had only about 31 samples, and it had about a 0.83 um, genetic diversity value, and this one has twice as much samples and it has slightly lower genetic diversity values. And the significance um, of this is that um, employing these methods can be applicable to any study system and provide resolutions for species identification as part of biodiversity assessments. The newly added molecular data for Tobias species should result in more effective and accurate um, identification um, of populations within the Yucatan aquifer. And it actually provides a potential for better understanding of these connections between proxy um, among proximal and distant case systems across the peninsula, promoting dispersal to different subterranean environments, including their species distribution. And lastly, their characteristics and adaptations of flagged species highlight the importance of understanding species identities and distribution as it relates to the conservation of federally listed taxa that includes um, the vulnerable species sister taxa to um, T. Pierce and the July, as mentioned before and others unknown, with unknown conservation status that includes Tefladia zillumensis, species A, and species B. And then just a little quick thing of uh, methods remaining. I've only done haplotype network reconstruction and gotten their diversity values. I still have to do um, the, continue on doing it on the other genes. I've only done it on 16S. And I further have to do more um, DNA extraction, amplification, and sequencing of newly collected samples that were recently um, brought to the lab. And then as well as uh, species delimitation methods that has not been done yet. So. And then real quick, I'd like to acknowledge my um, advisor as well as any co-authors that were part of this research. And yeah, thank you.